First of all, introductions. I'm Bettina McMahon, I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Australian Digital Health Agency and I'm really looking forward to spending the next 90 minutes or so with you to brief you on this exciting program about the National Infrastructure Modernisation Program. Um, so step one, if there is in the unlikely event an evacuation, um, please just stay alert and take advice from the agency staff. There's a number of us in this room here. The assembly area, just for your information, is up um, at Woden Town Centre, so a bit of a hike. We're hoping that won't, won't happen this afternoon. Can you please put your phones on silent? And um, if you do need to take a call, we understand. Can you please step out of the room to take that call? We have agency staff who can um, be with you because as a visitor, um, you'll just need somebody there with you and we can arrange that for you. And while you have your phone out, we are going to be using Slido this afternoon to take questions, particularly around the processes of the RFI. Um, so there's information on the sheets on your seats about the Slido number. It's hashtag 1258. So it's written on the top of that, that page that you've got along with the, um, the URL you can go to, you can start putting questions in there ahead of the session um, as, as they arise during the briefing this afternoon. Um, I need to remind you that the agency is recording this session um, and we'll be publishing this on the website um, with information about the, um, about the process. And um, your attendance here this afternoon in this session is consent for the agency to publish this video in accordance with the terms of the RFI and the industry briefing consent form that you use to register. So hopefully that's not a surprise to you. And, and one final point, the agency has independent probity oversight of the process that we're following here. Um, relating to the National Infrastructure Modernisation Program and our property advisors are actually here um, in observance today, observing this session um, who are with us. So with that, um, our agenda this afternoon, um, first of all, we'll be having an acknowledgement of country from an amazing Australian, Steve Renouf, who I'll introduce in a moment. And he's also going to share some of his personal insights about his consumer personal journey. We'll then have a session on digital health opportunities and aspirations where you'll hear from our CEO, Tim Kelsey, and, and a panel of experts um, from our community. We will have then a briefing from Ronan O'Connor on the request for information process itself and a panel who will take questions and answers um, about the process um, for you to um, participate in. And then some final closing remarks. And we're looking to finish in around 90 minutes, but we do have some additional time available up until um, about five to five. If there are more questions, we're happy to stay here um, and to continue to answer them in this session. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Steve Renouf. Steve is also known as the Pearl, and he's a well-known Aboriginal rugby league player who played for the Brisbane Broncos, Queensland and Australia in the late 80s and 90s. Steve was 17 years old when he signed with the Brisbane Broncos in 1987. The young footballer showed a lot of talent and his future looked really promising. However, at the age of 23, he suddenly felt seriously ill. And when his doctor told him that he had type 1 diabetes, Steve was actually relieved. Having type 1 diabetes for most of his professional football career, Steve not only lived with diabetes, but he excelled with it. Steve went on to create his legend, which put him in the top 10 try scorers of all time in the National Rugby League Premiership competition. He also made the Queensland State of Origin team in 1991 before progressing to the Australian side in 92, a year that saw him make the winning try in the World Cup something that still brings a smile to his face to this day. He signed with English team Wigan in 1999 and was selected in both its 2000 and 2001 dream teams before he retired uh, from football in 2002. And in August 20, uh, 2008, he was named a centre in the Indigenous team of the century. Steve's not just known for being a fantastic rugby league player. On leaving the game, um, he has worked as a Queensland Government Sports and Recreation Ambassador for eight years, promoting healthy lifestyles and physical outdoor activities amongst children, before taking on an important role of Indigenous Strategy Manager for Australia's largest rail and freight operator, Horizon Rail and Freight. And in this role, Steve coordinates education, employment and job opportunities, cultural awareness and careers across all of Horizon business units for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Please join me in welcoming Steve to the stage. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Bettina. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm here to do acknowledgement to country, um, and I'd, I'd like to start with that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the, the Gunnawal people of the land in which we gather here today um, and pay respect to Elders past and present. 
Uh, I, I think, and I'm not talking, um, I'm talking to the, the educator here around the acknowledgement to country that uh, how important it is, um, especially for myself personally. Uh, this isn't my country. Uh, I'm from Queensland, um, from my mum's side, uh, we're the Gungri people from southwest Queensland, a little town called Mitchell. Uh, my grandmother was born out there, as they call it, on the Yamba, uh, on the creek bed. Um, so on my mum's side, that's where my country is, and on my dad's side is north of Redcliffe in Queensland, going up the coast, and that's Gubby Gubby country. So it's for me uh, more so that I, I acknowledge the traditional owners down here. As, as mentioned, this isn't my country, so we'd like to thank them for having us here today. And uh, also, um, I'll just run in my association with um, digital health and the My Health Record. Um, I've been involved um, since 2016. Um, when I first got asked to, to co-chair the Medicine Safety Committee um, yeah, as a consumer advocate, um, I, I was a bit taken back and I wasn't sure that I fitted the bill um, when, when asked to do that. And I, I still remember my first meeting, um, I think it was at, with Neville Baird and, and Steve Hamilton. Um, they've been very good to me and taught me a lot in the last few years. But, um, so I still remember being there and I was, I was very nervous, obviously, uh, guys like Shane Jackson uh, uh, holding me to account up the front. And, and, but I learned very quickly uh, the reason why I was there. And um, in, in talking to Steve Hamilton, um, obviously having uh, type 1 diabetes now for 26 years um, and handling that, I've got five children, uh, four boys and one girl. Um, I've got originally... I had the four boys, they were all diagnosed with, with type 1 as well. Uh, and then earlier this year, my daughter was type, uh, diagnosed as a 22-year-old when I was diagnosed. So all five of my children, um, I've passed something on to them. And um, so all type 1 diabetes, but uh, all very well controlled. Uh, I like to think uh, they've had a good role model there. And um, my ex-wife and I have, uh, have been there for them. Obviously, they're, they're a lot older now, um, uh, you know, uh, the youngest is 18, the eldest is 27 this year. And, and coming back to uh, being involved in medicine safety, um, you know, there's two of those boys who have celiac as well. And my daughter and one of my sons um, who aren't celiacs uh, have Addison's as well. So we sort of hit the jackpot there um, with a lot of endo endocrine uh, conditions. So, but, you know, they handle it very well. Um, and it, so it sort of seemed a, a good fit, um, especially when my uh, then 19-year-old daughter, um, she, was, uh, she went through a lot of mental health problems. Um, and a, a few people have heard this story, but um, you know, she, so we went through that for three years with her, her partner and I, um, you know, firsthand. And then we realised after a few years and after a few um, suicide attempts that... Um, uh, there was a lot of things that weren't right, um, and it, it was it was obviously we we figured out there was you know she had two psychiatrists, one in the clinic, one outside, and uh, there was no communication, and um, so she had this myriad of drugs, um, which we we got a third party involved who sorted all that out, and and sort of then rained on me that uh, you know with, with my health record, uh, there's a lot of things that could have been avoided. Um, this is only going back. Um, you know, not that long ago, um, prior to my health record coming up. So that's when I realised that, uh, you know, uh, it's something that, um, you know, I could have a bit of input into. Um, and outside of that, uh, my other work I do, uh, we have the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health, uh, which has started in the southeast corner. And, you know, we have uh, 22 uh, Aboriginal medical services in the southeast corner, uh, the fastest growing Indigenous population in the country. Um, so we're working hard, uh, you know, working towards um, you know, our interoperability around uh, my health record. Um, we, we still got a, a fair way to go. We're an we're a, a, a organisation that's grown very quickly. We've grown from four AMSs uh, to 22 in 10 years. Um, so it, it's sort of like we're, we're catching up in that space, but it's somewhere we obviously are going to be. Um, so for me, uh, that even made even more um, prevalent that uh, I, I do the work that I do uh, with my health record and the Digital Health Agency. And um, I'd just like to take, uh, thank Tim uh, and, his, and the team. 
Um, and then we have Travis in Brisbane. I'm, I'm doing a bit of work for the agency there in the cultural diversity space. And uh, I can tell you um, the organisation's pretty well, they're very good uh, in that space. Um, it's just about um, you know, everyone realising the work that they're doing uh, is very important in that space. So thank you and thanks for having me. think about what's good for you. Puts the person absolutely at the centre of their information. It's not about the government, it's not about even the health providers, it's about you. It's about you making the choice that you want to have access to your information. You have complete control. It's controlled by you. It's got to be a benefit for yourself in a whole health approach. It's much easier to keep all my records together and have a full medical history. Oh, and I won't have to carry around this huge big case of um, x-rays and scans and ultrasounds. We're going to have all of our medications in one place. We're going to have all our testing in one place. The GP can see it. If I turn up at the hospital, they can see it. If I've had a scan or an ultrasound, they can see it immediately. And when we go somewhere, I can just open my phone and go, this is the information you need to know. gives the patient a sense of safety that there is always a record following them around. It will help us help people to live longer lives, healthier lives, more productive lives, and on occasions it's actually going to save lives. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks to the team that put that together, and thanks to Steve Renouf, above all, for his acknowledgement of country and the fantastic work you're doing, Steve, with us at the agency and more broadly in the community. So thank you, too, to all of you for coming for this uh, briefing and look forward to your questions. Uh, my name is Tim Kelsey. I'm the chief exec of the Australian Digital Health Agency. And actually, just before I get into the short slide deck that I was going to just uh, uh, talk to, I just want to, I was reflecting on Steve and what you were talking about, and to some extent, the opportunity of my health record, I think for m most of us, all of us perhaps, is kind of self-evident, but the world we are still in is one of fragmentation of information, and it puts us all at real risk. And I just reflect on a, a conversation I had at the Royal Perth Hospital, actually, which has been the subject of a programme that we've been working on with the Commission for Safety and Quality, where we've been working with emergency physicians to support them to take best value from my health record now that they can actually see it, and uh, it has increasing volumes of useful clinical content. And there was a case just the Sunday or a couple of Sundays before I was there a few weeks ago where a man had turned up at the triage to, to the emergency department. He had then collapsed. He'd been, he wasn't really able to articulate much about what had happened to him. Uh, clinicians thought that he'd had some sort of overdose but couldn't make that diagnosis. They now routinely look up the My Health record. They looked up the record found the discharge summary that he had received from a neighbouring hospital uh, just shortly beforehand in which he was prescribed quite a large volume of, um, of beta blockers, and uh, unusual beta blockers, and they surmised that this was what he had overdosed on and put together a care plan accordingly. He went up to ICU, and in the opinion of that team, that saved his life. And it, that happens on a scale that we don't know. We, we don't know just how much harm people are being put uh, in front of because of the absence of simple digital data sharing. And that is, of course, why we're all here. And the opportunity we now have to take what is, frankly, a, uh, an unprecedented initiative globally, the Health Record System, um, old in a way as its technology might be. It offers fantastic opportunities for connection. But what 
opportunities do we have in the future to make those connections just altogether more dynamic? And how, how can we use this opportunity to respond to some of the challenges of new technologies and new clinical opportunities around things like precision medicine? And we're not going to talk too much about that today because we want to hear from you over the course of the next few weeks about just what should we be thinking about in relation to the structure of such an important national service supporting the future opportunities for technology, enabling and empowering people with their health and well-being. So that's the context I just wanted to present. And I'm not going to talk for too long because we have such an expert panel coming on after us, just again to, in a way, try and, try and remind us this is not really about technology. This is about an imperative Australia has already taken uh, that, is, that is, of course, a clinical one, and it's a very important social one. But at its root, it is a human imperative. And we're talking about here, I think, a basic human right that is to have uh, you know, enabled uh, effective information sharing in healthcare, supporting us all and making us all safe and well. So, um, just to remind everybody, I'm sure you'll all know that there is, um, in 2017, the governments of Australia agreed for the first time a national digital health strategy, and that is the context in which all our operations occur. This is not just a strategy for the agency, it is a strategy for all of us, for Australia, for, for you in industry and enterprise, for others in research and clinical medicine and in consumer advocacy. It is a, 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 a plan that was worked up in genuine, authentic collaboration with the whole community, and these are the seven priorities that emerged. I'm not going to go through all seven priorities, and we've got rather a, there's, there's quite a lengthy slide deck here, actually, which we're going to make publicly available, obviously, so I'm just going to skip through it, but please do feel free to pick it up after the session and review it in more detail. So, my health record. Um, February 22nd, um, I think we'll come back to see, uh, was a historic milestone. It was a moment at which uh, we moved to national opt-out, essentially, to what we call the expansion of my health record, and at that point, uh, roughly 90% of Australians had a mild record, others, of course, choosing not to and opting out of the process. Um, at that point, uh, around 6.4 million records were ingesting clinical content, were activated, is a not great phrase, but were receiving content. That number is now nearly 12 million. So in the few months since uh, opt-out, there's been a huge increase in the active uh, value of my health records across the community. And obviously, as people visit doctors, nurses, other clinicians, their records too will start to host clinical content that will be of value to them as they make their way through their life journey. So that's where we're at at the moment. Most of those records have been activated, if you like, by clinical encounter. So that's the moment a prescription is uploaded or the moment you go and see a GP and they, they prepare a shared health summary for you. But quite a few have been uploaded by consumers, and actually perhaps more than we'd thought. Uh, at, at the last figures I saw, which were very recent, is about 270,000 people have gone through the process of activating their own records. So I think that suggests that although we're very much at the beginning of this process, there's growing public awareness of the opportunity of having your key health information in one, in one place. And you'll see that the 1.5 billion document uh, milestone was passed, uh, you know, an important reflection. We've got a lot of work to do to continue to embed my health record in clinical practice, but these are the statistics. Um, another important set of statistics for this conversation is that broadly, the clinical provider community is now very substantially engaged with the my health record. Um, community pharmacy and Shane, who will talk later, perhaps uh, deserves particular tribute here for, uh, with colleagues at the Guild and else uh, across the sector for really building uh, demand and active use amongst the pharmacy community. It's been quite extraordinary. 18 months ago, there were basically no pharmacists connecting and uploading. Today, it's nearly everybody. Um, we won't go through that. You can also see a huge increase in the number of public hospitals connected. Um, across all states and territories, so I'd like to thank them also for their efforts. Um, this just very quickly shows you a key metric of all this is, well, are people really using it for any useful clinical effect? And, and they are, let me tell you, but this just shows you in what are called river plots, just a growing um, cross organizational view of my health records. And I won't go into the data, but if people are interested, we will very shortly start publishing dashboards at much more granular level that will give you the insight into just how many cross organizational views are occurring. And you know, we've got work to do with various clinical communities and uh, out there, particularly in aged care, specialist medicine, and so on. Well known, I'm sure, to all of you in the room. Um, we've made a number of improvements to the way in which my health record offers value, and we've got more to make. And this is just a quick 
overview. So medications view was introduced um, last year, been very popular with people. It provides a snapshot view of allergies and most recent medicines. Um, obviously important now we've got such a volume of particularly community dispensed medicine information now in the My Health Record. Um, very recently released our new pathology and diagnostic imaging views. And what, that do, what those allow you to do as a clinician now is to um, organise those reports in time series order. You can start looking at them longitudinally. We're not yet at the wished for point where we can do that with atomic data. And that's actually one of the, one of the aspirations for this, um, for this whole uh, modernisation programme is that we do start moving away from PDFs uh, for some of the types of clinical document towards atomic data allowing for better and more granular analysis. So just quickly cover those things. Um, so here's just another human example of ways in which this is already happening. And although there's lots of work going on at the agency and with partners across the community looking at benefits, impacts, how those, uh, so, uh, how impacts being realised in the community, um, I just wanted to bring this one to your attention. So um, this uh, picture is from the... Uh, uh, Pharmacy Journal of Australia, which did a report looking at the, how, how local health services responded to the challenge of the Townsville, um, the Townsville floods and concluded uh, that my health record actually was a very important asset in a, in a time of proper disruption and fragmentation. And you can just see that quote there from Paul Kate, uh, Paul Willis rather than Kate's pharmacies, just, just reflecting on how important it was to have a common source of information during a period, as I say, of great social fragmentation and disruption. Now, very quickly, um, just uh, in terms of other, just to bring you up to date with other priorities, which are all part of this national infrastructure, and what we're hoping for is very creative thoughts from industry and other partners on how we might conceive of this emerging new national infrastructure. But secure messaging, the idea that we now have uh, standards agreed with industry to enable interoperation of directories so that clinicians can have confidence to, to communicate with others without the need for fax machines, rather like mobile phones, agnostic of handset, seems so ancient and ridiculous that we're in this situation. But we now do have agreement from everybody to move into uh, the future. And I think this is a very important milestone too. So thank you again to colleagues in the room who've participated in those conversations. Interoperability, there'll be more on this over the coming months. Governments at the moment are considering a series of recommendations that have been made with your help, with uh, the help of governments across Australia, around what are the principles that will in the future ensure comprehensive data flows across the whole of the health ecosystem. And we've made tremendous progress, I think, in talking about things like common identifiers, other kinds of common uh, standards to enable those, those data sharing arrangements. And as the governments reach their... Um, views on these recommendations, we'll be able to put those out into the public domain, but very significant progress has been made, and this is the sort of conceptual framing of the problem as far as the community has described it to us. Um, medicine safety, another big priority, um, just very quick snapshot, but the agency has been working very closely with colleagues in the federal department and across Australia on e-prescribing, um, very important priority. Again, we see that as a key part of this future national infrastructure, um, now, new standards for uh, software um, engagement with the new e-prescribing system are being developed. Um, so big progress being made there very rapidly. And these are some of the user cases that we've been developing um, across the community that we think will, first of all, enable us to evaluate the benefits of my health record in certain, for certain communities. So whether that's parents or elderly people, people with terminal illness. Um, these are programs that are already in action. And for example, in December, uh, we will be um, putting into proof of concept through with New South Wales Health, the very first national prototype for a digital baby book uh, in December and end of life care developing new ways in which my health record can support the management of end of life care to the, most, to the best uh, outcome for the, for the patient using my health record in Western Australia. So these are things you'll see more of, but again, components of a broader approach to digital uh, health realisation. So I will leave this slide with you as the final shot from me, but again, if I can just thank you for your attendance and for your input and your wisdom in helping us shape what I think will turn out to be one of the most important reforms in modern Australian healthcare. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, and I'd like to invite our panel members, thank you, Gabby, up, um, Shane, Leanne, Penny and Steve, if you'd like to um, come up to the stage. Um, so Shane Jackson, um, who you've, you've seen immortalised in our video already, um, is uh, a clinical reference lead with the Australian Digital Health Agency, 
is past president and currently interim chief executive officer of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. Leanne Wells is the chief executive officer of the Consumers Health Forum. Penny Shakespeare, deputy secretary for health financing with the Department of Health here in Canberra. And, and Steve Renouf, who um, we've already heard from and, and, and introduced. So um, I'm going to invite each of you to, to give us a short um, a minute or two of your, your initial remarks in terms of opportunities and aspirations you have um, for the My Health Record, the national infrastructure and digital health in this country. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, no oh, actually, uh, Switch on your mic. Thanks, Bettina. Um, I'm not sure that I ever held you to account, Steve. I'm <laughs> no, not, no, sure no, that's no. The, uh, <laughs> no. not sure that that'd be the wisest thing to do. But uh, <laughs> it's actually been a pleasure to um, uh, to work with with Steve on a on a large number yeah. of uh, uh, areas of focus, and especially around medicine safety. And I might just uh, concentrate on that to, to start with, uh, Bettina, because I think that's where we've got the one of the greatest opportunities uh, in the development of our digital health infrastructure to be able to improve uh, outcomes in, in that area. Uh, you, uh, members of the audience and, and others might be aware of a report that PSA released uh, earlier this year, a medicine safety take care report, which revealed 250,000 uh, people admitted to hospital each year, uh, 400,000 ED uh, presentations uh, related to medication misadventure, 50% of that harm preventable, uh, and that's, that's the opportunity. The costs from the hospital admissions are $1.4 uh, billion, and so that doesn't even include the uh, emergency department presentation. So the opportunity is immense. Uh, the opportunity from a cost-saving point of view is immense and the opportunity from a preventable harm uh, is important because 50% of that preventable harm, well 50% of that harm is, is preventable. So medicine safety is a, is a great opportunity and a great focus because we can actually get some tangible deliverables and we can show that some of the work that's being done and the developments in digital health are making a meaningful uh, difference for people uh, on the ground. And the World Health Organisation has a third patient safety challenge, which is to prevent uh, medication-related rela harm by 50%. And, and I think if we utilise our digital infrastructure well in the future, and we see that all of those things that Tim talked about, uh, those seven sort of priority areas, what they deliver is connected care. And that connected care uh, is vital uh, and will be manifested in a way that it will overcome fragmentation, uh, it will overcome those issues that we have around uh, transfer of information uh, from hospitals to primary care, and it will really improve that focus around medicine safety. And if we then have some clear measures around uh, uh, tangible benefits, I think that's where we've got an opportunity to actually then mobilise people behind us and, and show that we're, we're doing some, some great things uh, moving forward. Thank you, Shane. Leanne. Thanks, Bettina. Look, as someone whose day job is to represent um, patients and consumers in the community, um, I talk a lot about what, what person-centred or people-centred care is all about. Um, connected care, as Shane said, continuous care, coordinated care, multidisciplinary care, care available in a system that's, that's joined up. Um, probably comes as a surprise to some people that, that a lot of patients think the system is more connected than it is. Um, until they actually experience the system. Um, it is fragmented, it is disconnected. Um, so to me, you know, the aspiration and the, the enormous opportunity we've got with the National Digital Health Strategy as a global set of uh, priorities and, and, a, and a roadmap for where we want to take digital in Australia and the My Health Record as a particular more nearer term measure is to make real um, what we mean by person-centred care. Um, you know, there are several government strategies where it's often talked about and articulated, but often not translated. And I think we've seen my health record and, and um, the contribution and capacity, it's already demonstrating on the quality and safety agenda with medication safety in the, the Townsville example. Um, I'm enormously excited as someone who has had a long-term passion for uh, child and maternal health with the, the work of the National eHealth, um, Child eHealth, you know, collaborative um, 
had the privilege of chairing a committee with Meredith on that, a clinical consumer committee, and seeing how the work on the, the, the digital baby book is starting to unfold. Um, that's really exciting. We should expect no less of a modern 21st century health system. We've got the roadmap to do it. Um, you know, it's had its bumps, um, as every, every road has its bumps. You know, there were issues around quite a lot of noise about privacy and safety and those sorts of issues in the lead up to opt out. But there is no doubt, and CHF has been a, a strong advocate about this, that the opportunities, you know, have always far outweighed the benefits, uh, the benefits of, uh, of far outweighed the risks and the downsides. Um, you know, that, that really is a matter of how we manage risk um, how we manage the privacies and protections. And we've, we've got to take a continuous improvement approach to those. Um, and just one final comment. I was at a, a launch of a report by Research Australia this morning about their recent 2019 consumer poll. And the, you know, the community and the results of that poll told us, again, it's consistent with our own research at CHF, that. that People are very, very positive and very, very open to healthcare going in this direction. They want it, if anything, they want it accelerated in the same way that we have services delivered to us in the banking system. And, you know, the Tim's point, and it's up on the slide too, about secondary use of data and, you know, how we can make better use of data um, captured through digital platforms like My Health Record. Again, uh, if that's used for public good, for better medical and health research, for service improvement, for informing better policy, again, uh, the community and the consumer sector is really positive about that. They just want an assurance that the protections uh, are in place. Thanks, Leanne. Penny. The department's vision is uh, better health for all Australians now and future generations, so we're thrilled with the uh, capability that's already being achieved through the My Health Record uh, in terms of medication safety and the ability for more clinicians to see what's happening with patients' medications. Uh, we're thrilled now with the capability for test results to be shared, uh, and that's to improve patient care immediately, but also to make sure that we're thinking about the future generations as well, so we're reducing health expenditure on unnecessary tests and those sorts of things. So really, we're, we're looking for uh, the best possible care for patients now, uh, but also making sure that we can fund effective health care now and for future generations. And what I wanted to focus on a bit today is that future generations question, uh, because the trend in health care that we're now seeing is therapies that are not like the therapies we've been used to seeing in the past. Uh, so medicines where we have uh, large patient bases, uh, large randomised control trials and lots of evidence uh, to justify public investment. We're now seeing far more personalised therapies, cell-based therapies, genetic therapies. And our patients want and deserve to, to access these things, but often when we're looking at funding them or bringing them to the Australian market, uh, we still don't know for which patients they're going to work. Uh, and you know, some of the immunotherapies that we have at the moment are doing fantastic things, but they work in 30 to 40% of patients. So the industry producing these medicines is putting a lot of money into research and development, uh, and they expect quite high prices. And in a cost-effectiveness evaluation environment, um, we can see why that is, because if they work, they uh, reduce long-term health costs significantly. Uh, but if we don't know in which patients are going to work ahead of time, we have to be able to collect a, a data about how patients are responding. Uh, and so one thing we're certainly thinking about now is how we pay for performance at an individual patient level. And my health record is one of the uh, things that's going to help us do that. So recently we have funded a very high cost therapy, uh, not just the Commonwealth, but also state governments uh, called car -T. And you know, we're still looking at very small patient populations at this stage for paediatric acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. But that therapy may work for larger patient populations. And we're going to need to track whether or not those patients are still alive, uh, if they've responded to the therapy after 12 months, 24 months, and then invest public uh, funding uh, when we know that it's actually worked for patients. 
Uh, and this is an issue that uh, governments all around the world are grappling with. We're not the only ones thinking about how we're going to fund these therapies. Uh, and you know, we, we don't really want to be mortgaging future generations um, through very high upfront costs for things that, that don't necessarily work. So better patient data uh, at an individual level with consent is really going to help us invest in those sorts of therapies. That's funny, and Steve. Yeah, well, it's an uh, advantage of being on this end because I could just say just what they said. Um, <laughs> so, but for me, you know, uh, obviously uh, being a representative for consumer, um, and we're all consumers. So, uh, yeah, the exciting thing for me is um, when uh, industry, uh, when industry gets it right, that's when you know um, the consumers are going to be looked after. So, that's across the board um, uh, with industry and. Uh, I'll go to to, to pharmacy, um, not because Shane's here, and e-prescription. Um, you know, what a godsend! Um, mm, you know, yeah. That's is it going to be? So, mm. especially um, when you've got a household full of, um, you know, uh, medical problems, <laughs> you know, conditions. Um, so, and a lot of Australia does. So, you know, having the, obviously with, with pharmacy being the interface, um, I always always found them. Uh, the point in the in that journey that's so important um, they're the link um, and what I see happening in that space is what's excited me as a consumer um, so uh, as I said um, when that's all sorted and uh, you know sitting on the committee and, and hearing from all the different um, parts of the medical industry and um, you know um, not everyone sees the eye to eye um, it all works out in the end um, and we'll probably still be working that out. Um, but uh, what I can say um, from, from a consumer's point of view, uh, it's pretty exciting. And so what I try and do when I'm out and about, um, obviously with our, our clients through our clinics, uh, patients through our clinics, and with the public, I spend a lot of time uh, in the community uh, with our work. And uh, it's just about uh, bringing people up to speed. I mean, and as mentioned, there's still, there's still a pocket of people who don't know about the My Health Record. Uh, I was only speaking to a guy the other day, and um, I said, oh, you, you know, you, you, so you haven't opted out, have you? And he goes, no. I said, well, you're still on. He goes, oh, that's a good thing. And so, you know, they realise it's a good thing. And um, so I, I think the big thing for me going forward is around that education piece, how we, not, I don't want to say sell it, but, mm. you know, um, how we get that across the community. Thanks, Steve. Now, Leanne, a question for you. So Penny's talked about, um, the government's engagement in um, personalised medicine and opportunities for individuals to get better outcomes. Um, and Steve's talked about um, the need to engage consumers more. I know the Consumer Health Forum has a, a major program about consumer health literacy. What do you see as the role of, of um, IT solutions and digital solutions like the My Health Record to assist consumers become more actively engaged in managing their own healthcare and also building strong relationships with their healthcare providers? Mm. Look, it's an, an enormous enabler. You know, we, we you know, Penny talked about um, you know, how much waste we've got in the system and how much we spend on hospital care. Um, you know, we, we've got a 10-year a primary health care strategy about to be developed. We've got a 10-year prevention strategy about to be developed. Um, across all those spectrums of care, um, digital health, um, to help people uh, self-manage better, to, you know, monitor how they're going. It's, it's just really, it's, as, as Tim said in his slide, you know, this is about embedding digital, digitally enabled ways of nudging people to be more health aware, nudging people to keep a track of, you know, what their, what their 10,000 steps a day are. That, that's really practical stuff linked to your phone, linked to your My Health record, you know, that, that sort of notion of your, your health in your hand is, is really practical. So, uh, you know, in terms of supporting people to self-manage and take some control about how they do that and be supported to do that is enormously important. Um, aged care, you know, Royal Commission into Aged Care at the moment. Um, you know, Shane and I, we've had several discussions about, you know, medications and medication safety in aged care and what can be done. Um, what can be done to support better medication literacy, if I can use that term, in, in older people? How many times, I mean, I know I have with my grandmother, who's long since passed away, you know, she used to just sit there and 
empty her, what do you call those things, the Webster pack. Yes, yeah. She would tip all her pills out onto the table from her Webster pack, in and out of hospital. The clinicians would turn to me as, as the fat, you know, the granddaughter. Well, what medications is your, is, your, is your grandmother on? Well, actually, I don't know. So just having something there that you can refer to, that patients can refer to, and that clinicians know that's there as a, as a true and accurate record of the medications they're on, um, is just, it's just the practical day-to-day -day stuff. And then we've got the, the great future state. That's here and now, and that's where we should be aspiring to here and now, but the, the great future state about, um, you know, uh, digitally supported models of care reaching into rural communities and disadvantaged populations in, in ways that we're only just starting to scratch the surface, I think, is, is you know, part of the horizon, part of the opportunity. Steve, with a, with a household full of um, medical conditions, as you described it, um, and, and kids 19 to 28, I think you said, they're probably pretty digitally enabled and connected themselves. What's your observation of, of how active they are in the digital realm for other parts of their lives compared to the way they manage their health? And, and is that where you think it should be? And, and how quickly do you think the sector, all of us collectively, should move to support Yeah, well, I can guarantee you that the, the kids that age will latch onto it quicker than <laughs> I will, or we will. <laughs> Not speaking of everyone here, but... Um, uh, so, yeah, so for me, I, you know, that, for me, having, having the five children, uh, in, obviously, um, with, with their conditions, that, um, that's, a, that's a safeguard for me as a parent knowing that they, they will be engaged through that. And I know they, they are all there at the moment. And, um, you know, we, you, I've got the eldest one who's, who's um, you know, he's always a bit rebellious and um, says, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah about it. But I know he's on it, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't opt out. But uh, he, he always has his say. Um, but, yeah, look, I, that, that, for me, and I think for the whole community, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about... Um, in the Indigenous space and, w and what we do uh, with the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and um, I'm not going to go into detail about what we're achieving in the southeast corner for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health but once we're fully engaged with my health that's look, we're closing the gap now that then becomes serious in 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 that term closing the gap because that's going to make it a lot easier I shouldn't say easy but a lot more succinct than what we're doing. Okay, thanks. And, and final question for, for Penny and, and Shane. Um, thinking about the healthcare industry, the healthcare sector itself, um, this presents some major changes over the next um, decade or so in the way that you mentioned, you know, th therapeutics. Oh, sorry, we're almost out of time. Um, on the way therapeutic goods are made available, different um, medicines are made available, how we can assess the efficacy. Um, in terms of government support that we need to provide the sector, whether that's through education and support, training capability, and also through um, having active um, peaks such as the PSA, you've been particularly active, Shane, in, in the PSA, in, in driving digital transformation through your own um, professional cohorts. Have you got any comments um, for us and for industry about about that process and expectations of how the technology is um, is workable for those people who are going through that major transformation in, in their own work lives. Do you want me to go first, Penny? <laughs> uh, yeah, abs absolutely. I, I think uh, the the professional leadership is is vital, uh, but also frame it in the context of the the current problems. And if I just go back to a comment that that Leanne made around aged care, we we should know at an individual aged care facility level, you know, the proportion of residents who are taking antipsychotics that we don't. Mm. We, we only have a, a snapshot based on research reports. We just don't have that sort of data mm. Mm. where we know that we've got significant problems. And I think framing it in the context of, you know, things like transitions of care where people know it's a problem and saying, we can fix this, and trying to then create the vision of what that new ecosystem looks like, because then you get the buy-in from people. Uh, you get the buy-in in what the new world looks like. You get the buy-in to say, we know, you, you know this is a problem. This is how it can look in the future. And then the engagement with the professional bodies around you know, workforce uh, training, etc., is always, uh, uh, I, I think, helps the uh, professions change and adopt 
But the other thing that helps is when consumers demand that. Mm. Uh, from my own profession, pharmacy is very responsive to consumer demand. And consumers should demand uh, improved services, whether it be from pharmacy, whether it be from general practice, or whether it be from, from anywhere else. And uh, I think empowering consumers to say, I deserve better, means that those health professional groups are more likely to be responsive as well. Then around the back end, we make sure that we help them change. But uh, identifying the problem and showing them what uh, the future can look like is always very useful. So I think uh, our health professionals, our clinicians, are always interested in tools that will help them deliver better clinical care. Uh, and that's really, um, I mean, what the data we're talking about here can do, whether it's at a very specific patient level. Uh, so knowing if you're a GP, well, this patient's already had that pathology test, I don't need to order another one and wait for the results. I can go ahead and assist this patient with their care right now. I mean, that's a very simple practical example, but it's helping. Uh, that clinician do their job. So I think, you know, the, the case is there. Um, clinicians will support this, and I think as, as the use builds, uh, that will just improve. Um, but there's also, I think, you know, the broader patient literacy, which will help clinicians with their jobs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I expect what, what we will see is um, condition-specific apps that use the data, um, you know, subject to all of our Mm -hmm. privacy and technical <coughs> arrangements that we'll need to develop. Uh, but, you know, if you've got haemophilia, you'll want uh, a, an app that helps you manage your haemophilia that not just sort of tells you when you're going to be seeing your specialist or your GP or going for a test or um, going into hospital if you have to for your IV, IG. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll have other things in there that remind you, well, I need to take this medicine now or, um, you know, I haven't taken this, you know, test yet. Uh, so it'll be patient-specific care, uh, and that clinicians, I'm sure, will support as well because it's going to make their um, care job easier as well because the patient is managing their condition better themselves in partnership with their clinical team. Thank you, Penny. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. I just want to step outside. I'd like to now invite Ronan O'Connor, uh, National Health Chief Information Officer um, to the lectern, who is going to provide an overview of the request for information process. Thanks, Bettina, and good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm just, well, first of all, I'll just introduce myself. So as Tina said, I'm the CIO here at the agency, but I'm also um, the executive who's got responsibility for the whole national information in the National Modernization um, Program that we're all here to talk about um, today. So what I'm going to do is just take probably three or four minutes just to go through four or five slides. They'll just talk a little bit about the process and the requirements. So someone's got their phone on there. Um, so it's more about the technical requirements um, around the, the process. Okay, so as we have said, the, the, the purpose of today is around the, the sort of the National um, Infrastructure Modernization Program. And we heard quite elegantly from the panel and all the speakers today about sort of the, the opportunity and the aspirations around this program. So it's now sort of my responsibility on behalf of the agency to actually deliver that, to so say how can we respond to that consumer demand? How can we help those that are caring for those um, within sort of um, healthcare settings to sort of improve the, the outcomes of what they're trying to achieve? So what we have done here within the agency is set up a program, and um, in effect, that program is responsible for this modernization process. Um, the current situation at the moment is um, that we have the My Health Records and the wider national infrastructure in place that's currently operated or managed by um, the agency, but the current contract within um, the, that platform is um, up for um, renewal. And what we have done at this moment in time is actually extended that contract out to 2021 to allow this process to take place. So there's now this process that will take place around the, the re-procurement of that. As part of that, we've um, issued on the 26th of September a request for information. So you've all had access to that, hence that's why you're here today. And that process in itself is going to be a key input into the sort of the National Infrastructure Modernization Program. So that's effectively to inform next steps around this program going forward. 
And as Tim originally said, this builds on the, um, the National Digital Health Strategy, the Framework for Action, and also the, the, the improvements and everything that we have developed around my health record um, to date. Okay, thanks. So within the RFI itself, um, I just want to just highlight there's sort of five contextual points that's just really important that we would want industry to consider. The first one around that is in relation to the sort of the fundamental components of a system as it currently stands and also of the, the future system going forward. And that's very much around sort of privacy, security, and importantly, consumer choice. The second contextual point we touched on it a bit there in relation to the questions, was around that sort of consumer demand and consumer expectation, and importantly around service responsiveness and that whole experience around not just consumers but all users of the um, system as it currently stands. We would also um, like industry to consider the sort of the agency's role in the provision of national digital health um, products and services, and that's what we describe as the sort of the wider national infrastructure. And then at the same time, recognize there on four and five around what other system influences that are in place. So what we're talking about there is very much around, we've got legislative requirements around what we're required to do and deliver. There's rules in place. And then there's also um, other sort of standards that we need to adhere to as well. So I just want to just call that out as an important contextual point. And then the final one there is around the alignment with the whole of government. So we're working very closely, and we'll continue to with the likes of Digital Transformation Agency, but we need to recognize the digital service standards and so forth that are in place there in relation to whatever the future offering is going forward. So five is obviously my favorite number, because within this next slide, we've got um, five sort of focus areas that we've called out within the RFI. So at the back of the RFI, you'll see there's sort of your, your questions, but in effect, I just wanted to cover those off here in relation to what we would want to sort of hear from industry um, on in relation to this process. Before I do that, I just want to call out, as we've been very explicit within the RFI, that the agency has no fixed view of the, of the future. And what we want to do is to be informed and hear from this process but also other processes that are happening in alignment in relation to whether it's the interoperability work that Tim mentioned earlier, some of the other products and processes that are about to come online around sort of secure messaging and so forth as well. And what we will do is take all this information together and that will inform sort of next steps going forward. But within the RFI itself, we sort of called out these five sort of key um, focus areas. First one's very much around sort of the future design considerations. So including how and we cater for the future expansion, scalability, and the emerging technology and new technology areas. And that's the second one itself. The third one's around capabilities that may be required in the future. Fourth one's around considerations that may influence further development of products, such as my health record. And then the sort of the priorities for the future, including technologies, but also about potentially how we can drive some sort of efficiencies um, across the national infrastructure as well. So we'd be particularly interested to hear from industry on any views that you've got on that. So that in itself encompasses the sort of the response that we're hoping to get back from industry in the sort of the questions at the back. There are also other opportunities if you've got further information that you want to add, which you can do within the, the RFI process um, itself. But the whole protocol around the, the response is pretty standard. So we're adhering to, obviously, government procurement and guidelines. So we would expect that people would um, complete the response form and provide it. That absolutely needs to be submitted via false tender. We're not expecting to receive any more than 30 pages, including attachments or supplementary material. And what we have said is that sort of we've been taking questions to date, and the questions will, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions um, following um, my sort of few slides now, but that um, session will actually close on the sort of the 1st of November. <coughs> Any um, answers that we provide, they will be published via an addenda um, on Austender. And then similarly, I just want to call out, because we've been receiving quite a lot of requests from industry to, for meetings and people want a number of different questions, that just to reiterate that agency staff are not able to answer questions sort of outside this process. So hence, we called out earlier around our probity advisors and being in the room themselves. 
And then the other point just to make is that there will be um, this video of today. So there will be a link to that and uh, the whole briefing that will be provided um, early next week. So we expect that will probably go on all tender around sort of Tuesday or Wednesday. And then the final just slide for me is just around sort of next steps and future um, activities. I just want to reiterate that the RFI itself is a standalone process, that any future procurement beyond that will be done in line with government procurement standards, and any notification of any procurement will be done via All's Tender. <coughs> So I just want to thank you um, for your time and patience. Um, we're just shortly going to be joined for a panel, and then we'll have the opportunity then for you to ask questions. So I'm back. Thank you, Ronan. I'd like to invite the next panel members um, up to the stage. Steve Visser, Garth MacDonald, Meredith, Tony, and, and Daniel. So Garth McDonald is the General Manager, Technology, Delivery and Projects here um, with us in the Australian Digital Health Agency. Um, Daniel McCabe is the First Assistant Secretary in the Department of Health. Tony Kitzelman is our Chief Information Security Officer. Stephen Issa, our Chief Digital Officer. And Clinical Professor Meredith Maycomb is our Chief Medical Advisor. So we're going to bring up the Slido questions. Hopefully you've been um, busily putting some of those <coughs> questions into Slido. And we'll take those as the questions for this panel. OK. Um, and good to see the people are voting. So we're just going to work through these sequentially. Whichever ones we don't get to, um, we will respond to um, formally and include in that agenda uh, through Austender next week. So we'll start with question number one. A lot of information in the RFI about that is, is about that this isn't a pre-selection or a procurement. Are you able to give any advice on, you how, on how you see the procurement proceeding? I'm wondering, Ronan, if, if you're best placed to answer that question. Come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think th that the point here is uh, we very much want to sort of hear from industry. So this is why we're doing this process of um, an RFI. And we will gather all that information, and on that basis, then we'll form the next steps on the procurement. So at this moment in time, we don't have a sort of a fixed view on what that procurement looks like. Thanks, Ronan. Um, question two, I might th throw this to Steve Isser and Garth. Um, what does the agency see as the challenges in the current <coughs> systems that have led you to arrive at the conclusion that the system needs to be modernised? Um, it's probably not really a conclusion that the system needs to be modernised. I guess if you look at it, like any IT development hype cycle, we've gone through a point where you know centralisation, decentralisation, single stack architecture, service IT architecture, and we're sort of moving through that quite constantly, and it's evolving all the time. So looking at the panel earlier, talking about new things, and I've got the 15-year-old daughter who's like, why can't I just Skype the doctor and get a medical certificate? How do we future-proof for that? So there's sort of these unknowns. So while the system is robust and efficient and works very well, when that comes along, are we going to be flexible enough to put new bits of infrastructure, new bits of software connecting to the current system to enable this broader connection? So that's really what we're looking at. So it's not a, there's an end of life, it's more what next and how do we be ready for what's next? I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, again, it's about the flexibility and the scalability. Whilst we, we find that the current system, as we've gone from six, that six million records to 12 million records, is an achievement in itself. Uh, as Penny was saying, the future models of care talk to things like precision meds and uh, very personal meds. And what that does is uh, increase data, increase use, uh, and increase models of care. So having, a, having an infrastructure that allows us to do that um, across the country is really important. Um, and being flexible and scalable enough in the infrastructure to put things in and take things out, as Garth said, is really what's driving this. Not that it's not working now. We've got, as Tim said, 12 million active records and 22 million records um, in the system now, working well, but it's future-proofing uh, based on what we're seeing as the industry uh, progresses. Ronan, I think you addressed this earlier, but for completeness, is the Accenture Australia proprietary limited contract still due for renewal in 2020? Um, yes, so I, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, to facilitate this process and to consult with industry on wider, 
and we have to take the decision, so we extended the extension contract to um, the end of financial year 2021. Thanks. Uh, Meredith, we put you on the spot with this one. How do the plans for the My Health Record complement or compete with programs such as New South Wales Single Patient Record or Queensland's Repository and Viewer? Yeah, now that's a, a commonly asked question actually amongst the clinical community. So I'm glad that one's come up because in fact they don't compete, they shouldn't be seen as competitors, they, they complement each other. And in fact it's really important to understand that a lot of our digital systems are there for different reasons. My health record is there to give me as a clinician access to a wealth of information that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, and through systems like the viewer, I would, as a, a member of that community in the Queensland system, in that hospital system, be able to see detailed notes and things that are sitting in that system. But it's different stuff to what's shared by the general, broader health community and all around the country, in fact, that goes into my health record. So we need to understand the way these systems complement and enhance each other. And um, I, I was just reflecting actually earlier on the question these guys answered about why do we need to modernise? And I, I, I really want to point out that clinicians are absolutely agnostic to the way this is working technically. What we see is the effects at the coalface and what it really feels like for us to try and look after people and try and do our jobs efficiently, effectively, safely, better, actually progress healthcare. And we, we sit there and I, just, I was thinking of a young lady that came in to see me last week in my practice in Sydney and she had her medicines list on her mobile phone. But guess what it was? It was actually a photo of a handwritten scrawled list of medicines from another doctor that I couldn't decipher. And I've shown about six other doctors that list. No one can work out what all of them are. We've, we're having a bit of a competition at the moment. But, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. The rest of life is sort of progressing in ways and people in the community are using digital technology all over the place in sensible ways. And they are trying to use it for their health care. And we, we need the system to actually catch up and make sure it's supporting the way we need to move forward and practice in a modern health system. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, next two questions are around the, the program itself. I might direct those to you, Ronan. Um, so first, is ADHA planning on utilising other contracts or panels to inform or support this modernisation? And um, the program you talked about, can you share the stage that we're at, its governance, scope, timeline and anticipated outcomes? Okay, so yes, yeah, so in relation to the, the first one, yes, we will be um, following sort of Commonwealth procurement guidelines and using um, panels and, and so forth, but ultimately until we get to a sort of a view or form of view following this process, we're not in a position to sort of determine what that looks like at this moment in time, which is going to be a constant refrain from most of my answers. And then the, the second question was around um, the, the, the the stage of the program. program. Yeah, the program, it, we, we, we just set it up um, at this moment in time. The program is governed. Um, we have um, Tim as the CEO, um, he chairs the, the program board. The program board is constituted, it's got members of the agency, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, and the Digital Transformation Agency um, on that, that program board itself. And what we are doing is just overseeing the RFI process and at that stage then they will determine what the next steps are in relation to procurement. Thanks. I might direct the next question to, to Steve Isser on the agency part and Daniel if you've got a view at the Commonwealth level. How weighted is the agency and the government to the current solution given the amount of data ingested, time and money already invested, would we be willing to change the platform? Uh, I think as Ronan said we're not emotionally invested in any solution, we're seeking uh, the industry views. We could perhaps go down numerous models. Uh, there's the UK model with the spine, you know, essentially a, a large data repository with even bigger wall around it, or we could go down almost the Indian health stack, as they call it, model, where it's kind of distributed, or it could be a hybrid of those, those two things where there's, um, again, a national, a national index of conformant repository. So we haven't um, made up our mind, we're not wedded to anything, we're seeking industry view on, on your kind of networks and intellectual property to inform the decisions that the government make. You know, I'll just add to it, I think it's important that we acknowledge all the investment the government's made to date in the platform. 
we do have to acknowledge that this was built at a time when we were trying to move away from paper-based records to digital records, and I think that still has an important role to play. And how that takes shape and uh, continues to be evolve is something we can learn through this process. But I think many of the panel members have talked about all the new opportunities, which I think we would be limited in the way in which the infrastructure and the architecture of My Health Record sits today for us to look at how we can broaden the use of this kind of technology. And this is why this RFI process is really important, just to get insights about where government takes the platform. And while you've got the hot seat, Daniel, um, what do you see as potential roles for the Digital Health Agency in enabling the better integration of the mental health system as committed to by the Minister, if you have a view? I don't have a specific <laughs> view, but I think there is a, a, a very important role for us to look at how we continue to support mental health through uh, better digital connectivity, better uh, cares of plan options for individuals. Uh, I think it's an area which we collectively need to explore over the next little while. Thanks. I'll take this next question as, as about the process. So I'm confused about this process. Lots of talk about what we'd love to have, but nothing about how we as industry can provide this. There's a lot available if you'd like to buy. Um, I, I'll take the comment rather than a question. Um, unless anyone has a response to that, apart from noted. Yeah. Okay, we might move to the, the next one. <laughs> at what stage is the funding process at for the modernisation program, Daniel? I'll just say, I think uh, Ronan's made the point at the moment, we're really trying to understand what opportunities government has in terms of modernising the platform. And with that, I guess, understanding what options we might want to present to government. So it's really quite, it's critical for us to understand what's out there in the market, learn from that and start to then make some judgments about what that might look like for government. Thank you. Maybe Ronan um, or Steve on this one. What components of the NIM need to be in place by 2021 at the end of the extended Accenture contract? Yeah, um, once again, we, we haven't formed a view. We've got no assumptions um, whatsoever um, at this stage. And this is what we want to hear from sort of industry. And then we'll consider that and any other um, sort of market research and other sort of programs of work that we're continuing with at the moment. But ultimately, that's going to be the next step. I think it largely depend on where we end up with the concept of operations or architecture. Uh, are we going to break the stack? Are we going to com uh, transition it as, as it is now? So all of those decisions haven't been made, looking for views. And once we form a view as an agency and as a government, we can then start to make uh, decisions like that going forward. Next question. Will the procurement for current contracted services under the contract still occur this financial year? Uh, well, I think they're procured already. We went through a procurement process over yeah. two, or the department did, and so they will continue to be delivered under the current contract. Will be the answer to that one. Yeah. Um, how does the agency imagine creating a level playing field for providers against the incumbent being Accenture? Um, so yeah, very, very much um, around the fact that we're sort of set up this this formal piece of work, this program. Um, that's been put in place. As you can appreciate, we're following sort of strict procurement guidelines at the outset, and we have got very strong sort of probity arrangements already in place. So we've already had formal acknowledgement from the, the incumbent um, around those probity arrangements, and there's clear division around people who've got responsibility for running and operating the current contract versus those who will be potentially in any sort of bidding process um, around sort of the future. This next one for Daniel and then Tony. There's some one with your name on it there. Is, so Daniel first, is the focus of the RFI on modernisation of components under the remit of the agency or is it broader, including whole of government and other sectors? Well, the, the RFI and ultimately what, what, what we do with that RFI is the remit of the agency, but it is supported in the context of the whole of government agenda. Across government, we're doing a lot of things to modernise uh, service delivery through digital technology. We're working very closely with Services Australia on the work that they're doing on modernising the, um, the Medicare payment systems as well. And so I think it's fair to say we, and part of the role that I have is to make sure that we keep all of those things in sync, but this particular activity is the remit of the agency with support from the department. Thanks, Daniel. And Tony, one of the biggest reasons for opting out of my health record has been the potential for phishing, patient loss of security and privacy. Is there focus on this? 
Simply, absolutely. Focus on um, the security is a paramount consideration for the agency. Whatever solution we look at as we move forward in the future, whether it's the current stack or a future stack, it always must consider the privacy and protection of citizen data as a paramount requirement. So, yes, it is a key consideration. Thank you. Uh, Steve, maybe the next one for you. Are you looking to the industry to provide thought leadership and demonstrate delivered innovation to help shape the priorities for the agency over the next 10 years? Uh, yes, largely. Uh, but So the priorities are going to be shaped not only from the industry but also government policy and be driven to a large degree by our customers, that's clinicians and, and consumers. You're happy I said that? Okay. Um, so what we, what, when we develop our strategy we, along with government, it's largely uh, customer-led, insights-focused, uh, with a view on, I'm using all these buzzwords, but uh, continuous improvement. So as we progress with the strategy, yes, absolutely uh, led by industry and what can be provided, but also not just kind of the, the technical side of the industry, but also the, the clinician and the consumer uh, view as well. Garth, you're up. Uh, oh, sorry, something just quickly changed. I might just go to number two if that's okay. Um, are you open to the IHE architecture that was described in the original 2008 National eHealth Strategy, conformant <laughs> repositories, non-centralised data, etc.? cetera? Uh, yes, obviously we, we, we've had meetings and we work with IHE in different ways. Also looking at new things like fire standards and current incumbent um, sort of processes we're using around CDA and different documents. But again, as we're looking at the way forward, is IHE has been very much focused on hospitals and how they interoperate with internally, with fire and then interoperating with each other and then broadly. So for us, we need to look at that whole ecosystem. So as Meredith was saying, you know, we're really not just that here's the Queensland Health View and then here's the National. If we're going to have both and they need to talk to each other or share, we need to be cognizant of the IHG work, whether we use it or whether we use something that works with it, is probably then what comes out of the RFI. And, and to an extent, I think we would like to see, and if there's use cases and things that people have gone and used and interoperated between these different standards, how you do that. Because I think that ability to plug and play and connect is key. And so probably taking some of that advice from you guys and feedback on when you've been able to do those sort of cross-standard connections and so forth would be something that we'd be really keen to look at. Uh, next two, I think, for you, Ronan, around timing. Even hitting a 2021 timeline, given a potential service transition and procurement process, would tend to imply a tender within the next six months, would it not? Um, the timing around this, and currently, as the contract stands to 2021, yes, is extremely tight. Um, the agency sort of reserves its right to potentially extend that contract. Well, ultimately, we want to hear from industry to understand what options and what route we're going to go down. Um, Steve talked about potential some options around that, uh, and that will then determine um, sort of the, the next steps and the sort of the firm timeline for this. But ultimately, it'll be a matter for government at that stage as well. And that's a nice segue to the next uh, question, which is, is there an option to extend the extension contract beyond 2021, or would you have exhausted all available extension options by then? There, there is an option to extend beyond 2021. Tony, follow up on security. How is the agency planning on managing data sovereignty? Well, data sovereignty in Australia is very clear. We have guidance provided through the Australian Privacy Principles. The um, Information Security Manual for the Commonwealth clearly stipulates that data and sovereignty is a requirement for it to be kept onshore. So it is a critical component, and um, whilst we have um, a strong focus on it, um, it should allow you the guidance around looking at the solution you bring to the table and how that meets those requirements around security and data sovereignty. Uh, Garth, does the scope of the RFI apply to other nationally operated Australian digital health programs? Um, so essentially the Digital Health Agency operates the My Health Records Service which is made up of a number of portals, document repository service, gateways and so forth. We do cross fund to people like DHS, the HI service, we use national um, security processes like Medicare, PKI and NASH, which we sort of leverage and PRODA. So we're really focusing on what the agency directly manages, but we, as things come back in the feedback, that will then inform whether there's a broader discussion with health of opportunities in that other space. But I think the main thing is to really meet the contractual obligation of refreshing and, and market testing the contract in the time frame. I'll just add to that. I think it does provide us the platform to have a look at additional opportunities uh, across government with all the programs that we're we're working with industry and working with other agencies just to make sure that we can potentially take on different things over time as well. So it's very important that we don't have just an eye for what we have today, but an eye for what we can do in the future. Thank you. Uh, 
A few of you might have different, um, come at this next one from diff through different lenses. So maybe we'll start with Meredith. If there is one top priority or problem that you have not yet solved that you must in this process, what is it? And then we'll take um, any views from others. Mm, well, that's a brilliant question. One top priority or problem. Uh, I'm not sure I can narrow it down to one, Bettina. That's the issue. No. Uh, look, I, I think the, the key thing from um, the point of view of making sure that People are getting better health care, but we've also got the ability to reach into the future and evolve the way we're practising health care. For me, it's, it's really around that um, solving the problem of having such a fractured health care system. And I'm using a word that I'm stealing from a GP I met up in far north Queensland recently who said essentially her patients who walk across the road literally from the hospital next door, she can't get the information she needs to look after them sometimes from an outpatient clinic right next door to her, um, you know. And she used this word fractured care, and I think it's a great description. Um, it's that connected up issue. Uh, really, we just need to be able to get our systems to interoperate in a better way. And we've got a, a big piece of work going on around that, but I'd love to see the modernisation of our system absolutely supporting that. Any other perspectives? Any others would like to? I think uh, making sure that as we continue to evolve the system, it's seamless at the point of care for a provider. Uh, and that goes to the problems we've had around interoperability and trying to continue to bring more and more of the profession onto the platform uh, and across all, um, all um, set of care settings as well. So, mm. I think the current national digital health strategy, as well as the framework for action, starts to put in place those almost basic building blocks or the foundations for an evolved or more mature digital health ecosystem, whether it be secure messaging uh, or, or the interoperability standards that should be done by 2022, building on that with a, with a future uh, view on what could shape digital health in this country, whether it be secondary use and uh, an enduring architecture to provide the data, whether it be how we interoperate with devices or internet of things, taking kind of the very basics that we've started to implement now like secure messaging and interoperability as I said and building on that uh, in the future. I think probably lastly it's just around that speed to market so we have new ideas we can go through and conceptually build them and design them but because there's so many moving parts of the health system be it through connecting with software vendors and national repositories and so forth it's getting that so that once we've designed and built it we can connect it very quickly so we get to the end point of care as quickly as possible. Steve, question on priority. Is there a priority order for modernisation of the components under the remit of the agency? Short answer, no. Okay. <laughs> Would the RFI consider complementary components of infrastructure to be consolidated for efficiencies, better interoperability and customer-centred services? Maybe Garth? Potentially, yes. I mean, it's not ruled out. I, I think there's some common sense in that, but then it's around funding and, and um, how we best operate, because we've got to consider not just how we technically build it, but how we run it efficiently in the future. Uh, I might take this one. The agency has been reluctant to meet with industry over the last year or so. Does the agency see this changing, even if part of a structured, of, even if part of a structured engagement process? Um, it's the first I've heard that we've been reluctant to meet with you. I've met with m many of you in this room over the last year, as has my team. If you've got any concerns around our engagement outside this process, um, please come talk to me. In relation to engagement on this process, um, Ronan's set out the requirements um, and the probity around that, so it's, it's fairly well defined for this piece of the, the work. Uh, I'm hearing lots about care, and that's fine, but modernising the infrastructure hasn't yet been discussed. I get the reason, but not about the modernising modernizing piece. Rona, did you want to address that one? So putting into context the background about what we're trying to do in this RFI as opposed to stipulating specific requirements, or Steve? Yeah. Everything we do as a digital agency is to support healthcare. It's not about the technology itself, and we've got to be very clear that it's to support clinicians and it's to support um, patients. So if, we're, if, if the view is we're not talking about modernisation, we're talking about care, I think that's the right discussion to be having. So digital as an enabler for, for the standard processes, uh, the workflows for, clin for clinicians and consumer journeys. So I think that's the right discussion to be having. I, I'd love it to be consumer-led and clinician-focused. Um, so, it's, as I say, it's not so much about the technology, but the enablement of uh, healthcare and a more efficient healthcare system through the use of technology. Thank you. Meredith, 
which country do you look at as best in class for embracing modernisation and innovation for digital health? Oh, wow. That's a great question. You asked well, to pick one again. <laughs> I've got to pick one again. I'll uh, start with Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, ironically, I just rushed from a presentation to the Global Digital Health Partnership in Hong Kong, where they're currently meeting. So we, we have a collaboration of 30 countries now around the world and the WHO who are participating and in sharing information about digital health innovation and policy directions and other aspects, cyber security, etc. And in fact, it's a very difficult question to answer because across that spectrum of all the different elements of the provision of digital health services, in fact, different countries have got quite different approaches and different levels of maturity. But we really all face very similar problems and the, the, the common stuff around interoperability is, is one great example. Um, I think in terms of which countries doing the best, if you like, um, look, there's only a handful of countries like Australia who are delivering uh, what we know as, as a personal health record, which is my health record. That is a digital health record which gives a person access to their own health information, the ability to share that with, with a clinician and control who gets to see it. And there's really only, there are less than 10 countries in the world essentially who have gotten to that point at the moment. And they're using very different methods to do it. So I'm not sure I can pick a winner at this point, but I'm, I'm very proud to say Australia is one of those leading examples. And we've got a lot of countries turning to us at the moment to look at the way we're doing my health record. Um, there's other countries that are more advanced than us, for example, with electronic prescribing, with the way consumers have access to their pathology information or the ability to, say, order pathology tests and other clinicians be able to see them. So um, one example that springs to mind is Denmark, where they have a repository system where a request can go up and anyone can pull it down and then someone can do it and there's the information. So there's, there's a lot of different um, ways of designing our infrastructure to support the end game, the objective of giving people access to their own health information and allowing them to share it with, with others. But I, I have to put Australia out there actually in terms of personal health records with my health record. Thank you. Uh, Tony, another question on sovereignty. Latest discussion is on other country agencies having access to specific information on request, e.g. US agencies. How does this play to data sovereignty? It's a great question. There's a lot of conversation at the moment, both domestically and internationally, around data sovereignty and the roles of, um, for example, foreign uh, nation states wanting access under their respective legislation. The simple reality is that this data doesn't belong to the Australian government, it belongs to its citizens, and our My Health Record Act is very explicit about the controls put in place there. So the paramount consideration for us is data sovereignty. We're here to protect the data and the security that belongs to our citizens, and that if a question was to arise around a foreign nation state wanting access, that would be something that would be handed to government as an, in, as an inquiry through our foreign departments. Garth, um, or perhaps Ronan, uh, will feedback from, received from last year's industry consultation on my health record platform inform this RFI, or is this no longer relevant because of a revised scope? Um, no, it is continue to be relevant, and that will be form part of what we're hearing, yes. Uh, not sure who wants to take this one. Would the agency consider proof of concept opportunities or test products already available? in other international agencies versus building bespoke solutions? Maybe, Steve? Yes. Um, short answer, yes, absolutely. Um, testing testing uh, models of care or technology through a process is absolutely part of not only this process, but how we operate as an organisation. We've currently got 15 test beds operating uh, across the country, and it, it does form part of our strategy, so yes. Meredith, you might want to take this next one. Why do you ignore outpatients, the chronically ill, the frequent flyers? They outnumber inpatients by several orders of magnitude. Not a focus and not funded. So maybe you can uh, choose to comment on the, on the statement and then... Yeah, well. sure. Why do you... Well, I'm not, the you, I'm assuming, is the implication it's the Australian Digital Health Agency. I, I'd, I'd like to argue against that point. I, I think, in fact, um, you know, with my general practice hat on, especially our outpatients and the, the dilemma of working out how to share that information with primary care professionals so that um, we know what's going on is, is something that's, that we're acutely aware of at the agency. And we, we have a, a large network of um, clinical professionals who are digital health experts that we call clinical reference leads 
Many of those are based in the hospital sector and um, we're acutely aware of this as, as, as quite a struggle. And I suppose the, the you know, there's a lot of uh, reasons behind some of the underlying causes of why the outpatient departments may have been left out of, of some of these um, advances where we have some stuff going up from hospitals but not necessarily the, the information coming out of outpatient clinics. Um, but look, there are parts, there are pockets of um, innovation that we've seen recently. In fact, we, we uh, have seen some great work being done in, in the Wollongong PHN in that region. Um, they've got some really great new innovative models where they've got outpatient departments who have started testing ways of sharing their information with general practice and others. Um, so I think we, we've, we're seeing some advances, but we're really, yeah, a, a little ways behind, I suppose, in terms of the content that goes up from that space. I might, I know it's not a yeah. technical point of view. One and thing and if I can just say, we've got time for one more question, so if you want to vote, that'll be it, and the others Sorry. will be honest. <laughs> go ahead, Gus. Um, is there any things like Allied Health? So there's been a lot of work with the agency around ways we connect allied health. Often they don't use clinical systems. If you go to a specialist, it's often very paper-based. So we've been a lot around digital literacy, trying to get access to our systems without having to have large desktop software and so forth. So I would see that that be something that we would be interested in, but it's also somewhere we're driving because as people are discharged to hospital, they're going to more an allied health or a holistic health type process rather than the GP. How do we connect those? So it's something that we're working on from a connection point of view because we think there is pockets of the data, say, around medications that is extremely valuable, some of those areas. And so we are working on that, um, but it is an ask because it's not a connect to our current software. It's often getting that software in place in the, in, in the first instance. OK, so um, please, can you consider a procurement model that allows for ongoing feedback and engagement, not just via a formal RFX document submission, um, maybe Ronan? Yeah, well, that's, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll take away and consider as part of the, the, the program board. OK. And I know I said that was the last one, but I did see one flash up that I know you'll have a view on. Who's going to win the Rugby World Cup? <laughs> All right, look, thank you. We've, we've still got some other... Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> so we've still got some other questions. Um, we will answer them and they will be um, posted up. So if you, if you still have some other questions you want to make through the Slido process, please do so. Um, and, of course, there's um, other information on how you can lodge submissions of, of questions through to the 1st of November, at which point um, we'll close that question session. Um, so I'd like to thank the panel um, for your questions and remain here because we're just about to close. Um, and I'll just come to the... Let me just come to the last PowerPoint slide. Um, the RFI... Thank you, someone who knows how to use this laptop. Um, the... So we have RFI tendered documents. Um, you can get those um, on the web at tenders.gov.au. With those details in there are the email contact um, details. The RFI briefing information at conversation.digitalhealth.gov.au. And, um, of course, you can also come to um, our own website. So I'd like to thank um, you for attending um, as well. We'll publish something within five days. Um, and, and really looking forward to getting some of your creative ideas to help us inform our thinking, shape the direction of this, um, this future modernisation program and, and to partner with you. So thank you very much.